The Big Bang Theory started about uh, 1965, before, a little before that. They said the thing that exploded was a few light years in diameter. Then they said, oh, no, it's only uh, 275 million miles. Then they reduced it to 71 million miles. Then 54,000. Then they've made it a trillionth the diameter of a proton. Now that's tiny. Boy, we're talking tiny now. And now they say just nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's Discover Magazine a couple years ago. Where did everything come from? Boys and girls, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask, ask Alan Guth. His theory explains everything. Wow, i got to meet this Alan Guth guy. Well, Alan Guth said in Scientific American, the observable universe, that would be uh, us, could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. In the Greek, that's a dot. He said, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Yes, boys and girls, you see, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. And they call that science and put it in a science book? I'd call that a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. I said, Professor, what happened to your dot? He said, well, Hoven, 20 billion years ago, all the dirt in the universe was drawn into this little bitty tiny dot. And it was spinning. It spun faster and faster. And one day, boom, it exploded. Big bang. And the pieces that flew off became the galaxies and sun, moon, stars, and finally people. You know, here we are. Nothing but stardust. I said, sir, can I ask you a few questions, please? He said, sure. What do you want to know? I said, well, you told me 20 billion years ago, all the dirt got together for the big squish and the big spin and the big bang. Where'd all this dirt come from? You know, who made matter? He said, we don't know about that. I said, okay, now hold it, sir. If I told you that I believe about 6,000 years ago, God created the heaven and the earth, then you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I, and I don't know. But you said 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and you don't know where the dirt came from. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. <laughs> don't tell no. Don't tell me my theory is religion and yours is science. They're both religion. But the news media tries to make it always look like it is science versus religion. I did a debate in El Paso, Texas, and they said, religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. What are they trying to imply just by the title? You see how they always try to make evolution part of science? No, evolution's a religion. Both creation and evolution are religious. I mean, you have to believe in either one. The difference is the evolution religion is tax-supported religion. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. By the way, these two timelines, it's the same information right here. The Bible teaches about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood, wrecked everything, dropped everybody's property value to zero. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, and here we are today, waiting for the Lord to come back in about five minutes. Okay? This is the Bible view of history. On this chart, every inch is 150 years. That's a long time. If I was to show you what the 20 billion year chart would look like at the same scale as this one, this bottom chart would have to be 2,100 miles long. That's from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon. I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale for this one, okay? The professor said he did not know where the matter came from. I said, well, sir, could you tell me where the laws came from? You know, the universe is run by laws, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia. Uh, Boyle's Law, Cole's Law, you eat that with potato salad. Uh, who made the laws? Hmm? And by the way, why aren't the laws still evolving? Hmm? Why are the laws always so steady? The laws don't evolve. Gravity's consistent. Why don't you weigh more 10 pounds one day than you do? The... You say, I do. No, I'm not. Never mind. Uh, where did the energy come from? I mean, who bought the gas to run this machine? It takes energy to make something move. Where did the energy come from? The professor said, well, we don't know about that. I said, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? <laughs> How many of you know what a merry-go-round is? You go round, round, round till you puke, okay? He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round at Berkeley. I said, you ought to get one, man. You could learn some good science on a merry-go-round. If you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round, any fourth graders in here? Who's in fourth grade? All right, I like fourth graders. I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade. 
it was before they diagnosed ADD. Um, we're going to put some fourth graders on the merry-go-round, and we're going to get the high school football team out there to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it will possibly go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. Uh, we'll I'll tell you later, okay? We're going to spin the merry-go-round clockwise. The kids are going to go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming at the football players, come on, let's go. Can't you go faster? Let's go. Move it, move it. You get up around 30 miles an hour. The kids enter phase two where they stop screaming. They just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> you get up around 60 miles an hour and the kids enter phase three where they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, they'll keep going faster and faster. When you get to about 100 miles an hour, you should go into phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. <laughs> now when this happens, you will notice an interesting phenomena of physics. If the merry-go-round is spinning clockwise, <laughs> when the kid flies off, <laughs> the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or a telephone pole. That's because of a law known as the conservation of angular momentum. You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, the fragments will always spin the same way because the outside's moving faster than the inside. People say, what if they hit each other? They can't hit each other. Drop a hand grenade off, let it explode. The longer you wait, the further apart the fragments become. How are they going to hit each other out there in the field someplace? Uh, duh. We could talk all night about the conservation of angular momentum, but the professor said, yes, I'm familiar with the conservation laws. I said, well, then good, sir. I have a question for you. If the universe began as a swirling dot, sh big bang, like you said, shouldn't everything be spinning the same way? He said, yes. I said, would you tell me why, then, that two and possibly three of the planets are spinning backwards? Can you tell me why eight of the 91 known moons are spinning backwards? Would you tell me why four planets have moons going both directions at the same time? Can you explain to me why some whole galaxies are spinning backwards? He said, that's interesting. <laughs> I said, no, sir, that's more than interesting. That's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. He said, why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, sir, it's very simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and God did it that way on purpose, just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. <laughs> Now, I do believe in the Big Bang, and I told him I believe in the Big Bang because the Bible teaches the Big Bang. It says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The original Greek, that's a Big Bang. Mm -hmm. See? So there's going to be a Big Bang, but it didn't happen yet. So kids, if you go to school and some teacher says, do you believe in the Big Bang? You can say, yes, I do, and you better get saved and get ready for it. <laughs> the Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. Mm -hmm. By the way, if the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed throughout the universe, and it's not. It's lumpy. They're called galaxies, and in bazillions of miles of nothing, called voids. That's why they're so desperate to come up with theories like black holes, dark matter, antimatter. They're looking for some way to ex salvage the Big Bang and ex still explain the missing matter. Hmm. Even Fred Hoyle said, I have little hesitation saying a sickly pall now hangs over the Big Bang Theory. The theory's been dead for 20 years. They just don't want to bury it because they don't have a replacement. The only other thing they thought of is God did it. Oh, we don't want that. So let's hang on to the Big Bang Theory. Get the book The Evolution Cruncher if you want a whole lot more on that. Here, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the word thermodynamics, thermo means heat, and dynamics means power. So it's the power of heat. You, you can't just create things from nothing. And whenever there's an exchange of energy, there's something lost. The second law of thermodynamics tells us everything tends toward disorder. If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, fall apart, or break down. Nothing gets better by itself. That's what the Bible teaches. It says, the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment.